Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. A wild boy in Iowa. Considerable excitement exists in East Davenport and Gilbert Town in consequence of a wild boy who has been seen by several voracious individuals prowling about the woods at the back of Judge Grant's farm and on the river banks and island. About a week ago, a man returning from a shooting excursion saw what he at first took for some wild animal crouching by the bank of the river. It suddenly plunged in and emerged with a fish, which it devoured ravenously. Getting closer to it, he saw that it was a boy, apparently about 15 or 16, entirely without clothing and covered with light, sandy hair or a silky appearance. He plainly saw the face and describes it as revoltingly ugly and brutal in its aspect. He attempted to approach it, but the creature became alarmed and taking to the water, swam to a neighboring island and hid in the sledges. On returning home, he gave information and a close lookout has been kept. The creature, whatever it may be, has been seen twice. On to the next one. In Howard County in Iowa, in winter, authorities received dozens of complaints about bears bothering livestock, chickens, and garbage dumps, and that large footprints of an unknown bipedal creature were found. They were hairy humanoid prints. They weren't bears. On to the next one. In Humboldt County in Iowa, in winter, the occupants of several farmhouses complained of a hideous-looking man who made the nocturnal practice of looking through their windows. It was more like a gorilla than a man. On to the next one. In Jackson County in Iowa, Gary Koontz shot at a four- to five-foot-tall Bigfoot which screamed like a woman and then disappeared into the bush. On to the next one. In northern Clayton County, a large brownish creature, very tall, was first heard and then seen to run across the road, down the ditch, and leap over a fence and run off into a cornfield. The next day, I went back and checked the road and cornfield and found large smudged footprints. Upon commenting about this to some elderly residents, I was informed that the creature or creatures had been in the area for better than a hundred years from old reports of them and intermittent cattle and sheep mutilations. The creature had a foul smell to it. This occurred in the summer. It was a still night, moonlit, clear sky with no unusual noises. I was with my girlfriend. The area is rolling hills near a cornfield which adjoined a large woods within four to six miles of the Yellow River Bottom, which is heavily wooded and runs for miles with many wooded side valleys. On to the next one. In Clayton County in Iowa, Every September, my husband and I would go hiking to see the color. This trip was in September to Pikes Peak State Park, located on the highest bluff on the Mississippi River in Iowa. September is a time when the kids are back in school. There was only one other car in the parking lot, so the trails were deserted. Pikes Peak had several walking trails. We decided to take the longest which led to the overlook on the Mississippi. We had hiked almost to the point of the overlook. Fall had us crunching on the fallen leaves when we heard a large thump, thump, thump from behind the trees 
followed by a loud animal scream that we had never experienced before. Having hiked in the woods almost weekly, we learned to identify most of the animal sounds around us. This was not an unidentified animal. The screech scared us so badly that we immediately turned around and ran as fast as we could all the way back to the ranger station. Having reached the station, we immediately inquired about the animal we had encountered. We explained in great detail what had happened, but the ranger said they had no clue what we had encountered and that nothing similar had ever been reported. To this day, I'm still haunted by the sound of the footsteps and the screech. Until the Bigfoot programs, I had never considered that what we had encountered could be a Bigfoot. Now I'm 90% sure of my identification. I also noticed that there were no other sightings in the same area. Perhaps we were just at the right time and the right place. But I know what we experienced. My husband, we were alone on the trail. It was 1.30 p.m. on a calm day. The trees were in full color in a deserted state park. It was a heavily forested area near a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River in Iowa. On to the next one. In summer, at Lookout Point in Stone Park near Sioux County in Woodbury County in Iowa, being young and still interested in kissing girls, I had a unique experience. We were riding around in my Chevy convertible with the top down. On the edge of town, there was a park, Stone State Park, consisting of 1,132 acres, surrounded by farms and overlooking the Big Soup River, dividing Iowa and South Dakota. We decided to go to Lookout Point and park for a while. It was a beautiful summer night and just light enough to see in the dark. When we got there, the girl I was with and I decided to take a blanket and place it on a flat spot about 20 or 30 feet from the edge of the parking lot overlooking the river. To one side of where we placed the blanket, there were trees and bushes. The other couple were in the back seat of the car with the top down. We had perhaps been there no more than 15 minutes or so, and I was on the blanket kissing when all of a sudden there was something in the bushes beside us, screaming down at us at the top of their lungs. The volume was mind-blowing. As we were running, the scream seemed to still be directed toward us. I didn't even open the door of the car. I just jumped in, and I think the girl I was with did the same. Although we were only kissing almost right away, and for about 30 years, I believe it had to do with babies. For all that time, I was thinking she screamed at us because it was the wrong time of year for us to think about such things and thus got screamed at. Recently, I read of a Bigfoot encounter online. I think I may have found the answer to my thinking babies all these many years. At the time, it was just a sixth sense feeling. Her scream as it went on sounded just like a human woman, except louder with unbelievable volume. We were lying on the blanket, not making any sounds or movement. I believe she had heard the car pull up and was going to check it out from a safe distance. In August, there was a young one, three and a half feet tall in the garden near there, and a seven-foot tall one also observed near there. A seven-foot full-grown Bigfoot would most likely be female. What I heard sounded exactly like a woman. I believe now she was sneaking up to check out the people in the car. She had the much smaller young one with her. She didn't know I was lying by the bushes until she was pretty much right on top of us. She freaked out. It's just what I now believe happened. Could I be wrong? Possibly. But that sixth sense feeling about it, being about babies, has been with me for all these years. I've also heard several stories about them being in the area, but none since someone shot at it. It was late at night, very nice out, just light enough to see. The sighting was overlooking Big Thuke River 
and South Dakota across the river. Wooded area overlooking South Dakota flat farmland. On to the next one. When I traveled through the South, I kept hearing about a guy named Jack who claimed that he and his buddies were run out of the woods by several creatures while hunting in Colorado. It took some doing to track him down, but I finally found him through a friend of a friend. I called him and we were able to set up a meeting. I met with Jack late one evening in a small diner near Lake Eufaula. It was one of those places where the locals hung out. Not many people traveling through would stop in. Not that it was hidden or run down, just that it was a small, old-fashioned mom-and-pop type place. Old-timers and farmers would come in and linger all morning, drinking coffee, telling lies, and swapping stories. Most people would pass by it for one of the nicer franchises up the road. I arrived about 15 minutes early and found a booth in the back corner. I ordered a cup of coffee as I waited for Jack to arrive. I had just set out my recorder and notepad when I saw a tall, broad-shouldered man approach. He reached out with his hand and introduced himself as Jack. He recognized the clothes I told him I would be wearing. I stood and shook hands and asked him to have a seat. We ordered a couple of bacon cheeseburgers, and while we ate, we got to know each other with talk about hunting and fishing. I didn't want to push too hard to get a story. I figured we had plenty of time, and he would open up easier on his own. We skimmed the basics when I first called, but we didn't go into many details. He said, he didn't want me to think he was crazy, but I assured him that wouldn't be the case. I've heard it all before. Most people give me a hard time about it and don't believe me, but it's all true. I think I stumbled onto where they live and they ran me the heck out of there, Jack said. I've heard many stories where the creatures have scared people away, but I just said, really? Darn right, Jack continued. It happened a while back when I went on a hunting trip with a couple of buddies in Colorado. I'd never been hunting up there for mule deer, but always wanted to. We were way back in the mountains, places normal people don't go on any kind of regular basis. But yeah, I thought they were going to kill me and no one would ever find my body. I'll never go back again, not there anyway. It was like they were stalking me or something. Reminded me of that movie, Jurassic Park, where the velociraptor surrounded the hunter in the jungle and attacked him from all sides. He paused and looked down into his cup, then slowly raised his eyes to meet mine. I bet you already think I'm crazy, don't you? I don't know you well enough to make a judgment call like that, I said, but I'd sure like to hear about it. I have to say, I was intrigued. I didn't know Jack from Adam, but I knew I needed to hear his story before concluding anything. Anything to do with Bigfoot has always been like a magnet for me. The stories draw me in like a moth to a flame, and Jack's statement that he had found their home was a bonfire. Most of the time, I let folks tell their story without interrupting them. I make notes along the way, and when they finish, I ask lots of questions. I'll ask the same questions over and over in different ways. I find that when I do, I can poke holes in the story. If they're lying or unsure, I'll know by the way they answer. I have no tolerance for liars and hoaxers. I grew up hunting everything from squirrel and rabbit to deer and elk. I know a thing or two about the outdoors. I've been interested in anything to do with the subject of Sasquatch since the 70s. Jack got very quiet and looked me square in the eyes. I suppose he was sizing me up, trying to decide if he could trust me or not. He leaned forward and began. It was back in 2002 when it happened. It took us a couple of days to make the trip. We traveled out there in a suburban, pulling a 16-foot flatbed trailer 
with three four-wheelers and several large coolers for the meat. I nodded. Typical setup? Exactly. Nothing out of the ordinary. My buddies had gotten a hunting lease that had recently come up. They had a spot for one more hunter, and I got lucky. Or so I thought when they asked me to come. It was all primitive camping, though. No cabin or anything. Being so far away, of course, we weren't able to go scout it beforehand. We stopped at a little town for final supplies and were planning to stay for a week or so. It wasn't difficult to find. We found the gate and the combination lock opened with the code we were given, so we knew we were at the right place. We drove back into a place that the owner told us to look for. The best place to set up camp. There was a clearing with a fire ring built with rocks that others had used before. We got out, got the tent set up, and still had time to do a little scouting before it got too dark. Everything went fine that following day. Not much to talk about. The weather was great, not too cold, and the wind was consistent, making it right for hunting. Well, we had been at camp for a couple of days, and none of us hadn't seen much. No shooters anyway, Jack said. He took a sip of his coffee before continuing. I decided that I needed to go deeper, maybe cross the river and get back into places that only a billy goat would go. I had spotted an area the first day where I thought I may be able to cross. Jack pushed his ball cap back and stared at the window a moment, perhaps remembering details of the event. I never got the impression that he was making anything up. Early the next day, I got up before my two buddies, packed my stuff, put my tree stand on my back, and headed off on my own. I left them sleeping. I followed an old game trail a couple of miles back until I found a shallow place to cross the river. I had to scramble a little on the other side, getting out because it was a little steeper over there and slippery but it wasn't too hard. Keep in mind that it was still dark, and I was only using my flashlight to get around. With snow on the ground, I wasn't worried about getting lost. The sky turned a little grayer, and I figured I had less than half an hour before sunrise. I wouldn't have known if I hadn't stopped to rest. I turned my flashlight off and looked up through the trees. The only way to see. I wanted to find a tree that I could climb to give me a good view of any game trails that might lead down to the river. I guess I hadn't figured the terrain was as rough as it was, though, I'll tell you, I was huffing and puffing. Jack chuckled a little and took another drink of his coffee. I knew he was 48 years old from our previous phone conversation. He was in his early 30s when his encounter took place. Jack was still in good shape, a little over six feet tall, weighing probably 220 pounds. He worked in a sawmill and looked well able to handle himself. Anyway, when I saw the gray in the sky, I knew the sun wouldn't be far behind. I wanted to find a good spot before that happened, so I picked up the pace a little bit. A few minutes later, I heard footsteps just off the trail in the thicker brush, just beyond where I could see. I stopped to listen, but when I did, the footsteps stopped. But as soon as I took off again, the footsteps did too. Whoever or whatever it was paralleled me maybe 15 yards away in the brush. Now, I've been in the woods all my life, and I know what two feet compared to four feet sound like when they're walking, and this was definitely two feet. I would walk a few steps, and it would walk a few steps. If I stopped, it stopped. So, a thousand things started going through my mind now. Did one of my buddies follow me out here and is messing with me? Or is there somebody else out there hunting and we don't know about it? If that's the case, why haven't they said something? Is this other idiot going to shoot me thinking I'm a deer? If this other hunter has no clue that I'm a person, he might think he's stalking a deer and shoot. He stopped to take another sip. He finished the cup and motioned for the waitress to bring him another. I sipped my coffee and kept recording, still not wanting to interrupt with questions. 
I didn't want to cause him to lose his thoughts. I needed him to recall everything as it happened. I don't know. It had me a little jumpy, I'll tell you that. So, I decided that I would go ahead and shine my flashlight over there and call out. It's better to ruin a hunt than get shot. He laughed nervously. I shined my light over there and called out. Not loud, just loud enough to be heard from that distance. I said, hey, are you a hunter? But I didn't get a response. I tried again and still nothing. So I stood there for a few minutes, kept shining my light around, never heard anything. Finally, I took off walking and didn't get more than three steps when I heard it walking again. I pulled up short and spun around with my light. Whatever it was, took off running away. Crunch, 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 crunch. Faster and faster away from me. Then it was gone. Whoever or whatever it was was gone. So then I was really freaked out because I know for a fact that whatever that was Whoever that was, it was most definitely on two feet. By now, the sun was up. That made me feel a little better. Of course, it was still kind of dark in the woods, but I could see well enough that I didn't need my light. I heard the river gurgling. It was still on my left, not too far off, less than 50 yards from the game trail I was following. But another trail intersected the one I was on, and it looked like it came down from the ridge leading to the river. I decided to turn up and find a good spot that overlooked where these two came together. Both trails seemed very used, and I'd already seen several deer tracks, and some were pretty good size. I found a tall sycamore tree that would give me a good position, and I could get pretty high up it because it didn't have any low-hanging limbs. I set my things down, and got my tree stand around the trunk and got ready to climb. I had to saw off a few small limbs, but they were small and didn't slow me down. I climbed nearly 30 feet up before stopping. And before you ask, yes, I know for a fact that it was 30 feet because that's how long my rope is that I used to pull my rifle and pack up with. The waitress came back and topped off our coffee. Jack thanked her and got up to use the bathroom. I took the opportunity to make a few notes for questions later concerning weather conditions, timeline, clothing worn, and any types of scents or sprays that he may have been using. Jack returned a few minutes later, took a drink, and launched into a story again. Sorry about that, Jack said. Where was I? Oh yeah, I settled in my stand. I carry a small screw-in hook that I can tap into the tree and hang my pack on. Once I had that secured and my rifle hauled up, I settled in and got comfortable. I figured to be there till dark unless I got a good one, of course. This is Colorado, so there's snow on the ground and it's cold. But the trails weren't bad at all. Just perfect for our spot and stock, easy tracking. I guess I'd been in my stand for a good hour when I heard something hit the tree I was in. I felt it too. It was a solid thump like a rock or something. I didn't move. I just shifted my eyes and scanned the area that I could see. At first, I thought it could have been a woodpecker or something. You know how you start trying to imagine what it could have been given the circumstances. I responded, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so I thought it might be a woodpecker, a squirrel, broken limb, just about anything. But I was perfectly comfortable wasn't cold, and wasn't thinking about whatever that was earlier. I'd forgotten all about that, just concentrated on looking for deer. I wasn't about to move. Even though I was sitting 30 feet above the ground, deer can spot things if it moves. The art of camouflage is movement, or the lack of really. Just don't move. Concealment and visual deception mean blending into your environment. I agreed. I've taken more than my share of deer in the field, and camo is important, but he's right. There are thousands of trees, plants, rocks, and animals in the forest. Lots of things for the mind to take in and process. Most animals have a fight-or-flight survival instinct. They're attuned to their environment, 
and can spot things that don't belong, but they may not react to it unless it moves. A few minutes went by. I never moved, not a single muscle, but I kept my eyes moving, scanning every part of the woods I could see. I was listening, concentrating hard, but I didn't see anything, nothing new. Then I heard this loud thump answered by another one coming from my left, which is the trail I had just come down. Now, I've been in the woods hunting all my life. I don't remember a time when I wasn't. When you sit in a tree stand for hours, from daylight to dusk, you see and hear all kinds of things. Natural things. Limbs break, trees fall. It's all natural. You can tell, but in this case, this was a knock followed by another knock 50 yards away. Not tree breaks or limbs, so again, my eyes are moving everywhere. I'm not moving a muscle because, once again, the art of deception and disguise is controlling your movement. Snipers practice long crawls for hours and hours, sometimes without moving. This is the same sort of thing when you're hunting deer. Don't move, and the chances of being spotted in the woods are much lower. I was wearing camouflage, obviously from head to toe. It was just a simple snow pattern. And against the bark of the sycamore tree, I felt pretty comfortable sitting 30 feet above the ground, just below several limbs. But I was getting a little freaked out. I thought whatever that was that I heard walking through the forest this morning must live in the area. And that really got my heart racing. But I had the comfort of knowing that I have a 300 wind mag with me, not to mention a 357 Magnum on my hip that I always carried in the wood where there might be bears or big cats, just something I've always done. It gives me peace of mind, I suppose. A few minutes later, I heard another wood knock, but that time it was much further away and to my right, just the one knock. I thought, okay, whatever it is, it's getting further away, I'm good. But then I heard two more knocks, one to my left, and one directly in front of me. One of them sounded pretty close, but they were moving around. Whatever is out there, there are at least three of them. And that really put me on edge. I was frozen, scared stiff, not moving a muscle, spine tingling, nerves shot to heck. I had on gloves, holding my rifle across the brace of my stand. My thumb rested on the safety, and my finger ran just along the edge of the stock. I had one in the chamber and three rounds of the mag. I also had 16 other rounds in my pack, six rounds in the 357, and a speed load round in my bag, so I figured I was pretty good as far as ammo goes. But I got to tell you, a thousand things started running through your head. But right then, the only thing that I could think was, those are Bigfoot, and they're hunting me. I've heard all the stories you know. The wood knocks, the pine cones, the rocks thrown at campers, all those sorts of things. So now I'm thinking if that's what this is, I would shoot one. Could I shoot one? I mean, I don't know. I've never seen one and have no idea what I would do. So I started running through the scenarios. By my count, there are at least three of them out there. And it seems they were signaling each other. Do they know where I am? Did they lose me? Did the one that was trailing me lose me and they're communicating, looking for me, searching? I didn't have any way of knowing. So the next question was, how the heck do I get out of here? Do I wait until it gets dark? From everything I've heard, they see better in the dark than they do in daylight. I don't know. Who the heck knows? Do you know what I mean? I nodded and said, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. He continued, so I'm trying to figure out what to do next. I'm nervous as heck, shaking, feeling the cold, but I don't think it was the weather that caused that. I needed to get down, but there were 30 feet straight between me and the ground. How do I do that without being seen? But then again, I don't know if they know where I am or not. To be honest with you, I was pretty scared because I've never been in a situation like that ever. Who would ever think they would be in a position like that? I felt myself starting to sweat on my forehead. I needed to wipe it away 
before it fell into my eyes, but I hated to move. I waited as long as I could, but finally I just couldn't take it anymore. It's more annoying than a fly or a mosquito buzzing. I slowly reached up, and just as I touched my forehead, the bushes exploded in front of me, not more than 50 yards away. My God, I thought, I was going to have a heart attack right then and there. So my questions about if they knew where I was or not just got answered. I just gave my position away. This thing, I don't know what it was, was apparently stalking me. It probably had an idea of where I was, but didn't know exactly. Not until I moved and gave my position away. All I saw was this bush pile covered with snow explode like a grenade went off or something. I never saw what caused it, but heard these fast, heavy thuds and limbs snapping and something crashed through the woods on the other side of the little ridge. It must have run at least 50 yards away from me then almost in a complete circle in seconds. And then I heard nothing. That's when I knew I needed to get the heck out of there. But here's the problem. I needed to let down my pack and my rifle first before I could start climbing down. Those climbing tree stands are not fast enough even though they're pretty simple to operate. And I had my safety harness on which slows you down even more. I thought, okay, I could unbuckle my harness and climb down there as fast as I could. When I got close, I could hang off the platform and jump off the rest of the way. But what happens if I break my darn leg, or sprain an ankle, or any number of other things? I don't think I moved, but it felt like I had already run a marathon. My heart was pounding so hard, I was just waiting, because I was 30 feet up in the air. I don't think this thing is 10 feet tall, it can't reach me before I can get it with my 30 win mag, but there are at least two feet, possibly three. I started going over options in my head. Option one, and my safest bet is to stay put and wait for these things to go away. I've got food, but I could end up being out here all night and freeze to death. Okay, not the best option. Option two, lower down the pack and my rifle take the time to climb down, then shag butt out of there. After another 15 minutes of trying option one, I decided, nope, option two it is. He laughed at that last statement and took a sip of his coffee. I lowered my pack down with my rifle. I didn't hear anything or see anything during that process. So I turned around in my stand, got my feet in the hooks, and started climbing down. I got a few feet, then lowered my safety harness and repeated the process. I got down, maybe halfway, when I heard something crash in the woods again. I couldn't tell where it came from because, to be honest, my heart was pounding so hard I thought it was going to beat out of my chest. I'm still a good 15 feet up, but I figured, screw it. I unsnapped my safety harness, took it off the tree, and dropped it to the ground. I climbed down until I was maybe five feet off the ground and then jumped. I picked up my rifle first and took a look around. Nothing. I grabbed my pack and threw it on my shoulder. I just left my harness there and my tree stand attached to the tree. I took off down the trail slowly at first because I was looking around everywhere with my rifle at the ready. I had gone maybe 50 feet when I heard another tree knock. It couldn't have been 10 feet away. I spun and looked in that direction, but didn't see anything. I remember thinking at that time, sometimes you can be looking right at something and not see it, looking right over it. Then another knock came from the other side. It was a little further away and I spun around, but I didn't see anything either. I started moving again, walking slowly and steadily, keeping my rifle ready in front of me and my eyes looking everywhere. Suddenly, I heard footsteps again, really close to me on my right side, but it sounded like they were running away from me. It was out of earshot in a matter of seconds. I never saw what it was, but I felt a little relieved. I knew I needed to get the heck out of there, man. These things, whatever they are, seem to be hunting me. I was in pretty darn good shape, and I could run, but 
I knew it would be tough because of the snow and ice. I knew I needed to get the heck out of there. Whether or not I could keep my footing while running in that terrain was the question, but I didn't give a darn. I took off. A couple of times, I damn near went down. Carrying a backpack and a rifle in your hand, it's nothing more than reckless abandon. I just knew I was going to bite it and go roll it. If that happened, they could be on me in seconds. Then I would be done for. Jack stopped, sat back, and let out a long breath. He gulped his coffee, started out, and stared out the window. Neither of us spoke. I didn't want to interpret his thought, so I just waited. He seemed to collect himself and picked up where he left off. Luckily, that didn't happen. I got to the turn in the trail that goes alongside the river again. I slowed down a little because I couldn't see around the curve. I thought, darn, what a perfect place for an ambush. But there was nothing I could do about it now. I was committed to a head-first collision course with whatever's around that bend. I came to a skidding stop right at the corner, slowing down just enough to make sure that I didn't lose my feet. I kind of banged up against a tree and when I did, I shook the whole tree, knocking snow and ice off the limbs and dumped it all right on top of me. I waited a few seconds and caught my breath before taking off again. I could see the trail as it paralleled along the riverbank, but there was nothing there. I stopped and listened every few feet, but I wasn't seeing or hearing anything. I forced myself to breathe and calm down I think I was able to gather my darn wit about me then. I looked down and saw this track in the snow going across the trail. It was fresh. And I'll tell you, when I saw it, I knew what the heck it was. That track had to be every bit of 18 inches long and what looked like a giant human footprint. When I saw it, I stopped to take it in for a few seconds. And I remember goosebumps started crawling all over my body. That's how animals feel when they're being hunted. I don't know. I felt like they were stalking me and were just playing with me like a rat in a maze. As fast as they seemed to move, they could have me at any time. I pulled my rifle up and made sure my thumb was on the safety, ready to fire. To reassure myself, I looked around. My head was on a swivel, jumping at every little sound continuously searching, but I didn't see or hear anything. I started walking again, just a few steps down the trail, and heard a couple of wood knocks to my right, like boom, 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 and then there was a reply from my left, boom, boom, boom. The ones on my right were a little behind me, and as I said, the river was on my right maybe 50 feet or so. Whatever it was, was between me and the river. But where did the third one go? How did you know there were wood not? I mean, was it obvious? Have you heard that sound before? Oh yeah, very obvious. It sounded like a Louisville slugger in the hands of Paul Bunyan. I mean, it echoed out there in those woods like explosion. That'll set your nerves on fire. I sure darn well didn't notice the cold anymore. I'm good in the woods, a pretty good tracker, so I'm not going to get lost. I know it's hard to explain, but it was terrifying to think about the things that were doing that. No, I get it. I know what you mean, I assured him. As I said, I'm good in the woods, a pretty good tracker, so I'm not going to get lost, especially following my own tracks in the snow, he laughed. I saw my trail from earlier, so I was comfortable knowing where I was going. That was never in question. The question was, am I going in the direction that I wanted to go or the direction that they wanted me to go. I know they weren't humans. No human could move like that, not out there on that terrain. All I could think about was getting out of there alive. Sure, I had a rifle with me, but you can't shoot what you can't see. Heck, even if I did see it, I'm not sure that I could have shot one if that was what it was. I guess I was probably a couple of miles away from our campsite. If I took off running, I could probably get to the crossing in about 10 or 15 minutes, and then another 20 or so to camp. I'm not sure why I thought I'd be any faster at the campsite other than we had a vehicle. I sure was wishing I had one of the quads with me.
He laughed, but what the heck? I took off jogging. I can't call what I was doing running because there was just no way I could. Not with insulated bibs, coat, boot, a pack, and a rifle. It was probably more of a balanced wobble, he laughed. I'm sure I looked at sight. I had my focus ahead of me the whole time, but kept my eyes moving constantly. I caught a glimpse of them. It was brief, but I made it out to be about 30 yards out, staying in a brush line even with me. It was just a flash in the brush. I picked the pace up. I was in good shape, never smoked anything, but my adrenaline was pumping so hard and pounding in my ears that I started getting tunnel vision. All I could seem to make out were the few feet in front of me as I stumbled along. Again, I didn't even think about stopping and taking a shot. If it came to that, I wanted to be darn sure of what I was shooting. I guess I ran for several minutes. Before I finally slowed down, my legs felt like rubber. I was hoping they had stopped chasing me. I was breathing hard, panting like a dog, doubled over, trying to get my wits about me. When I heard a whoop, that's all I can describe it as. A whoop. Just one. I couldn't tell where it came from, but I jerked up and looked everywhere. I probably looked like an old tom turkey bobbing around and could hear the gurgling of the water nearby. I was still on the trail, but I noticed that I wasn't following my tracks anymore. I must have passed the spot where I crossed the river that morning, turned and looked back toward the trail. That's when I saw the other one. You are not going to believe this, but I swear it's true. When I turned this thing, that's the only thing I know to call it, jumped from one side of the trail to the other in a single jump. I heard a couple of heavy footsteps before it jumped, and then it cleared at least 20 feet, easy, about three feet off the ground. I saw it for only a split second, but I saw the way it jumped. It looked like a giant orangutan. Its hair was orange, not black, brown, or red like you hear, but orange, bright orange, I kid you not. Its arms were not just long, as long as its legs, and it was huge, just massive. It landed on the other side, went down on all fours, and disappeared. With that kind of speed, I knew I didn't have a chance in heck of outrunning it. If it wanted me, it could have had me at any time. It was as quiet as a deer, and something that big should have been like a bull in a china closet busting through the brush and the trees. But it wasn't. It was like a ghost. That made me realize that every time I heard one, that it was only because it wanted me to hear it. I didn't see its face, just its side. It didn't have a snout like a bear, though, just a flat face. Its face and hand were the only things that didn't have any hair. But its hair was long and coarse looking. I threw my rifle up to my shoulder and tried to scope it. But I couldn't see anything from my lower position on the trail. I listened really hard, and I thought I heard someone talking, only it wasn't talking, not really. It was more like a couple of pissed off bobcats. I don't know how to explain it exactly. When I heard that, I tried really hard to make it out, but as I said, it just wasn't any kind of language, but they were communicating of that much, I'm sure. I knew I wasn't going to sneak out of there, and I wasn't sure how far past my old trail I was. I had no choice but to keep going because I darn well sure wasn't going back the way I'd came. I would just have to look for another place to cross. I guess I walked at least another half an hour when I came to a spot right next to the river. The trail dipped through a small clump of saplings near the water's edge. I couldn't believe how lucky I was the water ran over the top of these granite slabs in that spot. And it was easy to walk across. You better believe I scrambled my butt across, hit the trail on the other side, and shagged butt back to camp. I glimpsed one of the mountain peaks through the trees, and that gave me my bearing. I kept looking back to make sure they weren't following. At one point, I could have sworn I saw one standing at the edge of the river but when I brought my scope up to get a better look, it was gone. 
I got back to the camp and the first thing I did was check my ammo. Here's the weirdest part about this. What time do you think it is now? I guess I must have had a puzzled look. I mean, judging from when I left that morning in the dark to the time I got back to the camp. Oh, I see. I would think it would be around mid-morning, no later than noon, I said. Yeah, me too. But when I walked into camp, I had to use my flashlight. That's when it dawned on me. It was almost dark. Ten minutes later, I saw a flashlight flickering around. It was one of my buddies coming back to camp. Somehow, several hours had passed. It was the weirdest feeling. I lost several hours. Now you tell me, how does that happen? Jack seemed earnest in the recounting of his story. At no point did I get an indication that he was making any part of it up, and I had no reason to doubt his encounter. What happened when your buddy got back? Did you tell him what happened? Well, he came into camp and asked me if I'd seen anything, meaning deer, of course. He put his stuff down, and I think that's when he noticed the ashen look on my face. He said that it looked like I had seen a ghost. All of the color had just drained out of me. Our other buddy got back to camp just as I had finished, telling Phil about what had happened. So I had to tell my story again. Did they believe you, I asked? I think they were skeptical at first and kept asking me if I was just messing with them. But as the night wore on, I think I convinced them, especially when I told them I wasn't going back out there and was ready to leave. I bet, I said. I guess they believed you then. Did you pack up and leave, or why did you stay? We ended up staying the night. They weren't about to flush this trip down the drain that quickly. Besides, it was too late to try and pack up the camp. They both agreed to go with me that next day to find my stand and bring it back. I told them I wasn't going back across the river alone. That night, we built a fire up and slept with our gun within reach. Our tent was one of those thick, heavy canvas ones that looked like a small cabin. We had our cot and wood stove inside. We brought cut firewood for it and kept a fire in it too. I kept that tent warm and comfortable, but we made sure the fire outside was burning all night. We had gathered plenty of dead wood for it. Did anything happen through the night, I asked. No, nothing happened, but we hardly got any sleep. The next day, I don't think any of us were eager to get started. We finally rafted out of bed after sunup and fixed some coffee and a little something to eat. We decided that we would backtrack across the river, find my stand, and if we had enough time, hunt that evening on this side when we got back. It shouldn't take that long to hike in a couple of miles and retrieve it. We loaded up with all the ammo we could carry and set out. It didn't take long to find my trail. We were at the river crossing in probably about half an hour. When we got to the other side, I think that's when they started believing me. There were tracks all over the place. Huge, bare footprints. These things were enormous. Even if I was trying to fool them, there's no way that I could have made that many fake prints. But here's the funny thing. We wanted to track them into brush, but every time we followed the trail, they disappeared. As if, and just stopped altogether? Exactly, Jack said. Were the woods pretty dense? In other words, do you think they could have been traveling through the trees? Yeah, and that's exactly what we thought too. That made us even more freaked out. So now, not only were we watching the ground, looking behind every tree and brush, but now we're looking, breaking our necks to keep an eye on the darn trees. Yeah, that must have been an eerie feeling. We gave up trying to track these things. I mean, what the heck were we going to do if we found one anyway? It's not like we were going to shoot one and bring it all back. I think we only followed the tracks a short distance just to make sure they weren't still around or something. I don't know, but we got back on my trail and followed it around to my tree stand, we might as well have stayed in camp. My stand was one of those climbers and built solid, brand new. It attaches around the tree and secures with a cable. It was still attached to the tree, maybe four feet off the ground. When I left it behind, I had slid out of my harness and jumped to the ground. We found the base of my stand 
still attached to the tree, but it was bent to heck. The top section had been ripped off the tree and thrown into the bushes. My harness was nowhere to be found. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. The tree was torn to heck, too, from where these things had tried to rip it off. That took some strength. So, what happened then? That's when we got the heck out of Dodge, Jack said, with a slight laugh. We weren't sticking around any longer. We had camp packed up before nightfall. Did you go home, I asked? No. Actually, we went to a little town a few hours away and got a room that night. I think we felt a lot better once we were clear of that area. The further away, the better. The next day, we had breakfast at a little cafe, made plans to go back only to a different area. Our lease was a little over 300 acres, with most of it on the near side of the river. I think we just needed away from there. I think we got our courage back. We didn't see or hear anything else for the rest of the trip. We darn sure didn't cross that river, though. We all tagged out by the last day, but we never told anyone else about it while we were there. Let's go back to the sound you heard when you thought they were talking. I mentioned the Sierra sound. These sounds were recorded by Ron Moorhead several years ago and are thought to be a type of language these creatures use to communicate. Let me play you a snippet of it and you tell me if it is anything like what you heard. I pulled up a video and played the sound. Jack's face drained of color. Yes, he said. That's very close to what I heard. It wasn't that fast, but it was garbled. I couldn't make heads or tails of it, but that's definitely it. On to the next one. In Camden County in Missouri, it was on Spring Oaks Drive. One summer while I was in college, I was living at the Lake of the Ozark with my high school friend at a house his father owned near Purvis Point. We were both from Kansas City, so it was a second home for them. I had been at the house many times over the years in high school and college. We had always talked about climbing the log flue, which was a long scar on a steep hillside you could see from the lighthouse marina looking east across the main channel as the lake makes the turn around the bend. This would be the closest thing to a mountain climbing adventure that the Midwest would offer. One afternoon, we took a small aluminum fishing boat over to the base of the flue, and as we started getting closer to the shore and approaching slowly, I kept hearing little poofed sounds in the water around us. Whenever I would look over, I would just see bubbles, but no splash, so I thought it was some sort of fish. We pulled up to the shore and tied up the boat. The hillside was quite steep, but still climbable and fully forested with deciduous trees, but not too dense to make walking a problem. Within a few feet of starting to climb and a few minutes of being there, rocks started falling around us, coming down through the trees from up above. We did not know what was above us if there were any road on the high ridge where people would be. So, we started shouting up the hill that we were down there and to stop throwing rocks. The rocks were at first half a fist size, but started getting larger after that. And soon they were football-sized rocks crashing through the trees around us, coming downward from above. We quickly got scared and got back in the boat before we got hit by one, since they were large enough to kill us. The smaller rocks continued to fall in the water around us as we pulled away with one or two landing in the boat. At the time, we wrote it off as probably someone having a whiskey still or a marijuana patch they were protecting. Although we could never see any smoke in that area or clearings of any sort. After watching Finding Bigfoot a few years ago and seeing how rock throwing is a common trait of Sasquatch, I emailed my friend who still lives near Kansas City. I moved to California after college and told him I think it was a Bigfoot encounter we had. Then last night, I saw a Bigfoot show from the Ozarks 
telling about others having Bigfoot encounters with rock throwing. We had heard of Bigfoot, but thought they were only in the Himalayas or Pacific Northwest. There was never any talk of Bigfoot in that area. And, in fact, I never heard any coyotes while in the Ozarks either. It is still uninhabited there, although many homes have been built in that area that were not there back then. It was early afternoon, clear, sunny, and hot. The area was native forest, deciduous trees mixed with small cedar. On to the next one. Near Ash Grove in Greene County in Missouri, I grew up on a dairy farm and would bring in the cows for the evening milking. This was often done on horseback for both pleasure and convenience. Since I was only 10 years old at the time, I didn't have to actually milk the cows after they were at the barn and could ride the horse while my brother and father milked. On the evening of the incident, I was riding our Appaloosa gelding south from the barn lot toward the back of our farm. Most of our farm had been cleared by dozing eight years before, but the farm behind ours was completely overgrown with trees and brush. It had not been used for anything for several years. The east boundary of our farm was a river, and there are many caves and silk holes in the area due to the cart topography. As I mentioned above, most of our farm was open, so visibility is good. I had ridden about 100 yards west of the barn and was within about 100 yards of the back fence when Ace, our horse, stopped walking. I kicked him in the ribs a little to get him going again, but he would only go a step or two and would stop again. This went on for several minutes, with me trying to force Ace who was a very well-behaved horse to go forward. I only managed to get him to go perhaps 20 or 30 yards before he would go no further. All the while, he was stamping his front feet and snorting air out of his nose in great puffs, as well as having his ears laid back against his head. I was getting very frustrated with Ace and was slapping the reins against his flanks and kicking my heels into him, but he wouldn't go. At this time, from behind a small cedar tree, a large, black, humanoid creature stood up, as though it had been crouched there hiding. It turned toward the back fence of our farm. Being just on our side of the fence, it took four or five long strides, walking upright, then jumped the fence like a man would jump over something, rather like a great hop. I didn't get a chance to watch whatever it was, because Ace turned and bolted back to the barn, and there was nothing I could do to stop him. I was barely able to stay in the saddle while he was running so recklessly. I got my father and brother, and we went back to where I thought whatever it was, but it was gone. I remember that it was not covered with long, stringy hair, as these things are often reported, but was very dark from head to toe. I saw it from about 60 to 70 yards away, clearly with nothing between us until it jumped the fence. It was probably 6 to 6.30 p.m., but it was only late September, so it was still light out at the time. There were other occurrences in this area with screams or cries at night and sounds of crashing movement in the brush near our house and a putrid, rotten smell that when smelled while raccoon hunting would cause the hounds to come back to us, and they would slink around at our heels with their tails between their legs. These things happened over several years, but mine was the only actual sighting of anything by my family. The behavior of the horse is the most telling detail of the incident. It was approximately 6 to 6.30. My father got off work at 5 and would come home and start the milking. It was clear and dry out with good light. It is open field with the whole farm being part of a large hill. There were oaks and walnut trees left after the dozing. There are many caves and sinkholes in the area with a large wooded area immediately south of the farm. The Big Sack River is the east border of our farm and the overgrown wooded farm behind it. 
on to the next one. Near Cape Fair in Stone County in Missouri. I was hunting with a friend and we had been out since early morning. It was hot and we were tired. We were just trying to get back to the car which was parked on a dirt road about a mile up a ridge that was directly in front of us. The brush we were walking through was thick, really difficult to get through. We were walking single file and I was behind my friend with my head down, concentrating on just trying to get through the brush without tripping. Suddenly, I heard an incredibly loud disturbance to my left, and at the same time, my friend had frozen in his tracks. As I looked to my left, this animal, there is no doubt a Bigfoot, came tearing down the ridge right in front of us. It could not have been 10 to 15 feet from us. It was so close, it must have been sleeping, and we woke it, because something that big would have made a lot of noise crashing through the brush on approach, and I heard nothing until it was right on us. We both watched it run past us to our right, on down this ridge, and disappear into the forest. It was huge, covered with black fur, and had long, long arms. As it went by us, it turned its face toward us, and its face was flat and hairless, but almost black, like its face had been caked with mud all its life. It was bent forward slightly, running, and it was still seven to eight feet tall. I was shocked at the speed. This encounter took no longer than ten seconds. We both stood there, scared to death, really scared. We were both familiar with the concept of Bigfoot, and had heard the stories of monsters in the woods. After we both got under control, I said, what was that? And my friend said, I don't know, but I'm getting out of here. We both started to run as best as we could for the fence line and the road about a mile in front of us. When we reached the road, we climbed a fence that lined the road. As we were crossing this fence, we heard the most bone-chilling scream I have ever heard in my life. This just added to our terror, and we continued to run for the car. We did make it out of there with nothing else to report. I had returned to that same area many times after, always with the same friend, and never saw or heard another thing. That was years ago, and I can still remember it like it was this morning. It was about 2 p.m., hot and sunny, in the deep wilderness in a valley. On to the next one. West of Prairie Home on Highway J, not far after crossing Pisgah Creek, there is an old farmhouse with a separate yard from the pasture. This was in Cooper County in Missouri. I was up getting a glass of water at about 11 p.m. My folks were getting ready for bed and that is what woke me up. We lived on a farm in rural Missouri, not far from the town of Prairie Home. We had a kitchen door that had a window in it that faced out to our carport. Beyond the carport was a two-acre field with trees at the far end. I got a glass of water with my back to the door when I felt a present. Well, our nearest neighbor was over a quarter of a mile away, and I thought that maybe our cattle had strayed from our big parcel into the small two-acre field. I moved my stool over to the back door and got up on it. I cupped one of my hands to cut the glare from the kitchen light on the window. It was pitch black out. I turned the carport light on and put my face back up to the window. It was still dark for a second or two when something stepped back from the door to allow the carport light to illuminate the situation. The thing that stepped back from the window was very tall, much taller than the standard height of a door. It had been so close to the door that it was blocking all the light from the carport. I screamed and dropped the water I had in one hand. The thing outside my door looked right, then left, stepped back a couple of steps, then turned and ran across the carport and through the field 
into the woods that bordered it. It was a couple hundred feet from the carport to the tree line, and I saw exactly where it entered the trees. It did not take it long for it to reach the trees. Before it ran, it was definitely looking right at me. It had very dark brown or black hair. I could see the reflection from the light from the kitchen in its eyes. I do not remember seeing any whites in the eyes. The face had some areas that showed dark skin with tufts of hair sticking out or surrounding the face and head. I never saw any teeth. Its arms were much longer in proportion to a human. They seemed to hang to the knees. There was long hair at the wrist that seemed to hang down over the hands. When I saw a grizzly bear run later on in life, I thought that the way its hair flopped up and down was the way it did on the Momo that I saw. It was a clear night, typical fall in Missouri. Somewhere after 10.30 p.m., there was some light from the moon, although not full, I think. It was rolling farmland with trees and creeks, forested except where pastures lay, lots of ponds with fish. Both of my parents came running when I freaked out in the kitchen. I was hysterical. They have never seen me act that way before or since. My dad did go outside to have a look, and there was a lingering foul odor in the air. We were raising chinchillas at the time, and they have a foul odor to begin with, so my dad just thought it was them. They were in a building only 15 feet from the door. The next day, however, we could see where something had moved through the field toward the trees. The grass was over a foot tall, and there was a definite trail that could be seen. There were no footprints, I think because of the length of the grass that was tromped down. I have since heard stories of a creature referred to as Momo or Missouri Monster. Since that day, I have read a lot on the subject. On to the next one. My husband and I were jugging on the Missouri River. We had the jugs all set out and were floating down behind them when we saw something big and hairy on the bank getting a drink. At first, we could not see it that well, but the closer we got, the better we could see it. It stood up on two legs and looked around for a few minutes. It did not see us at first and did not hear us because we had the motor off, and I guess he finally saw us because he walked back up the bank into the tree area. As he was walking, we could see trees falling. It looked like some type of machine was going through there and knocking them down, but there was no noise other than the sound of trees being knocked down. All my husband and I could do was look at each other. I guess because neither one of us could believe what we saw for years. We did not tell anyone, because we did not want anyone to think we were crazy. It was mid-morning, nice and warm weather, a sunny day. It was a wooded area and farmland behind the woods that were next to the river. On to the next one. Twenty young men of Williams and vicinity went to the mountains recently for a few weeks' recreation. They pitched their camp on the east side of Snow Mountain, where Paradise Creek plunges down the green, walled mountainside, where they lured the shy trout, the innocent deer, and the fierce bear from their haunts in the unbroken mountain fastness. The boys enjoyed all the allurements of the wilderness, and the wild game furnished their table with an abundance of the most delicate violin. During the evening, when all were about the campfire, they at various times paused the telling of mirthful tales, thinking they had heard an intruding footstep near the camp. At last, however, in the middle of the night, when all was still about the place and wrapped in slumber, one of the young men was awakened by an unusual noise. Upon opening his eyes, vision rested for a minute, on the face of a strange man, whose beard and hair were unkempt and covered in hair. As soon as the stranger found that he was observed, he disappeared into the fastness of the jungle. There was no more sleep for the young man, although he remained in his bed. In about two hours, the strange figure returned, his long hair floating in the midnight breeze, 
his chin resting almost on his sunken chest. His bony fingers bent like a cat's paw when about to spring, and from his eyes shone an unnatural light. Breathless did the young man who had the day before bravely faced an enraged bear watch the approaching figure, whose countenance looked ghost-like in the light of the moon. The strange man approached the impoverished table of the camp where meat and bread from the last meal remained, and he ate ravenously, more like a wild beast than a human being. Presently, the young men saluted him with a friendly gesture. Had an electric shock passed through his system, he could not have acted more quickly. In an instant, the wild man, for such he really appeared, sprang up the almost impassable mountainside as fleet as a deer. Excited and hardly knowing what he did, the young Denzians of the plains, who had conquered many fair heart and broken scores of fraction mules, sent a rifle ball in the direction of the departing man. Hardly had the smoke of the gun cleared away when great boulders came rolling down the precipitous side of the mountain, evidently loosened by the wild being which had passed up. The boys from that on lost their appetite for the juicy venison and delicate trout. They only remained a day or so after, but during that time the strange figure was often seen sulking near the camp like a wild animal. But Invariably, upon discovery, he would swiftly disappear into the most impenetrable jungle. On to the next one. It's funny how things get started, and then one thing leads to another, then you're having an adventure you never dreamed you'd have. And in my case, it was an adventure I never want to have again, I can tell you that. It all started with an ad on Craigslist that read something like, Dirt Bike. Super deal, wife says it must go, or I'm gone. I was 17 and had been wanting a dirt bike since forever, but I didn't have the cash to buy one. But as I sat there in front of my mom's computer longingly, admiring the photo of the blue Yamaha 250, my dad just happened to walk by and saw it too. How much do they want? He asked. It's only 1200 A real deal, dad. I think my dad was having a momentary flashback to his youth because he never bought me anything. He always made me work for whatever I wanted, except the basics, of course. And that meant I didn't have much because who can make much money at 17? I had tried the McDonald's gig but it started interfering with my homework, so my mom made me quit. You get straight A's the rest of the school year, and I'll get you one just like it, my dad promised. Man, talk about a motivator. I was going into my last part of high school, and I guess my dad wanted me to quit screwing around. I knew it was too late for a good scholarship to college, as my grades were just okay, but not stellar but I guess my dad wanted me to go out with a bag. And I did in more ways than one. I worked really hard, got straight A's. I don't think my dad really expected that. And I was soon the proud owner of a used Honda 250. My mom then took me into the bike shop and bought me a helmet, boots, and some knee and elbow guards. Man, I was all set up and ready to go. I guess they were considering it my graduation present. Some kids get cars, I got a dirt bike, and I was happier than if it had been a Mustang. I was ready to hit the trail, but I didn't have enough experience to really ride anything much, so I started riding at the edge of town, which backed up to a bunch of hills with old roads where the kids did BMX and people rode their ATVs. I worked myself around on that, and was soon doing pretty good. So I headed out on some longer back roads around town. This was in western Colorado, not far out of the little town of Fruta, and there were plenty of back roads. It was a biker's paradise, endless desert to ride. I guess my dad was kind of regretting buying me the bike along about mid-June because I hadn't yet got a job. I'd been too busy riding. I needed money to start school that fall as I planned to go to a nearby technical college that taught automotive and diesel mechanics, which is what I figured I'd do. Well, when I wasn't out riding, 
I was hanging around the bike shop, and that's where I met Cody. Cody was a year older than me and worked there. Doing some sales and office work, she was an avid rider and had even raced them. So she became my mentor. We became good friends and started riding together on the weekend. I learned quite a bit about dirt biking from her, and she helped me get a part-time job in the shop working on bikes. That was too cool, and it made my parents happy. Well, as the summer went on, I got to be a better rider, and one weekend, Cody and I decided to really hit the big time, to go on up in the books what everyone called the mountains that ranged the east of the valley. They were actually called the book cliffs, and they had this mystique about them. They were pretty big, and yet were close enough to town that we could reach them, spend the day riding, then get back by dark. We spent half a Friday there at the shop studying the maps and found a road that looked pretty interesting. We would ride up this canyon where there were natural gas wells. Then it looked like the road kind of climbed on up to the top. The canyon looked a bit steep and narrow, so we thought it might be a lot of fun. And when we got up on top, we could enjoy the views. The next day, we were all set. We had packed lunches and water and everything we needed to head out. It looked like it was going to be a typical summer day in Colorado. Blue skies and warm. I was really excited. This would be my first real trip on the dirt bike. I felt pretty competent, having ridden some gnarly trails close to town and all, but I was glad Cody was with me. I followed her out of town. Then we turned off the pavement into a well-maintained gravel road. Some oil and gas company had stuff up there. Tanks and pump jacks, so they kept the road maintained. We took it easy, not wanting to throw the gravel up and ding our bikes. Ironic as heck, as we usually rode like bats out of hell when we were out in the dirt. After a few miles, the road started up the canyon, and we were soon passing a few wellheads. Before long, the road narrowed and turned into dirt with no gravel. We had passed all the wells, and the road was no longer maintained. And I guess it didn't seem much use, just an occasional dirt biker or an ATVer, and few hunters in season. We had to take it easy, as it became rutted and rough. We were now climbing up the canyon, and the sagebrush became scrub oak, which got taller and bigger as we rode higher. Before long, as we continued climbing, we started to get into some small stands of what looked like pine and aspen. Now, the road was just one lane and barely qualified as a road at all. After coming up a really steep section, we topped out and were in a pretty good forest of what looked like Douglas fir. It was nice and cool, and we stopped for a break in a little meadow. We were having a blast. The only problem was we couldn't see out at all. We sat there and ate a snack, had some water, then decided to keep going. For some reason, we were both wanting to get up where we could see out, maybe because we knew the views would be incredible. We had climbed several thousand feet, but we weren't anywhere near the highest point, even though we had topped out of the canyon and were now in an upland area. I knew the books had plenty of black bears, so I was kind of keeping an eye out, but not a bit worried, as they're generally afraid of people. It's a wild area and has lots of backcountry. I bet nobody ever sets foot in, except maybe an occasional hunter. The outdoorsy people tended to go up into the higher mountains, like around Ore and Aspen and those areas, and the books really don't have many roads. Once we got up on top, it was just forest. No big peaks to climb or cool trails for mountain biking, though that's changing now. But when this happened, hardly anyone ever went into the book. We continued on, and the road got better, a little wider, though still pretty rutted. We had decided to go on up, as the map showed the road continued on up to the top of a 9,000-foot hill. To us Coloradonians, that's a hill, but I will say the road up there felt like we were going up a mountain. It's really rugged country. 
Well, we crossed a big meadow with aspens all around, and then we started climbing again. At this point, I can say we were way out there, and from the looks of the road, nobody had been on it for some time. It was pretty much grown over with grasses, but we could still make it out, even though it was starting to look more like a cow path. Now it wound through the aspens like a true single track at this point. We had been through all kinds of terrain by now, and it felt like a real adventure. Little did I know how much more of an adventure we were soon to have. Finally, after having to get off and move some fallen aspens from the trail, we reached the end. A small clearing, and we still weren't at the top. We had to get off and hike another tenth of a mile or so up to a rocky point. We grabbed our lunches and water and climbed on up, which didn't take very long. We were right. It was a view to die for. Well, almost to die for, because after I thought we might actually die up there, I wish I'd stayed home. We sat there eating our sandwiches, and we could see all the way into Utah in one direction and clear over to the San Juan Mountains in another, as well as high up onto the flanks of Grand Mesa. We were up so high, you could actually make out the curvature of the earth. What a place. We sat there, making out landmark mountains and such, and really enjoying ourselves. We were about as far from civilization as you can get, without actually hiking into the wilderness for miles and miles. We had ridden a couple of hours to get there, but it was well worth it. Even though my knees were getting a bit sore from all the obstacles we'd encountered, mostly logs, I was later glad for those logs because the practice going over them gave me the courage and expertise to do what I had to do later. It was going on mid-afternoon and I noticed some clouds building up. So we decided to head on back. Even though it didn't look like anything serious, we hiked back to the bikes and put our stuff away, then got on. I was getting ready to start up when Cody held her hand up, like, no, don't do anything. She looked at me and held her finger to her lip to not talk, then kind of pointed in the direction she wanted me to look, trying not to be obvious about it. There, standing right on the trail we had to go down was something really big and dark. It just stood there, kind of in the shadows of the forest, where we really couldn't make out what it was. But we could tell it was big and it appeared to be standing on two legs. I felt suddenly chilled and very nervous. I looked at Cody. Her face was white. Whatever it was, it was scaring her too. I looked back at the shadow and the thing was still standing there. It hadn't moved at all. It was too big to be a black bear and Colorado doesn't have grizzlies. By now, it began to sway back and forth like a ghost. I think it knew we saw it and was trying to somehow hide itself. I whispered to Cody, asking her what she thought it was. I don't know, she replied, but we have to get by it somehow. And it's too big. It could pick me up with one finger. Well, that was a bit of an exaggeration, but it was big. Maybe seven feet tall and massively built. It was hard to tell with it in the shadows, but it looked like it was completely covered in dark hair. But you could tell it was muscular and thick through the body. I have no idea how long Cody and I sat there on our bikes, just watching. It was starting to get late afternoon, and the shadows were lengthening. We couldn't just sit there any longer. We had to get out and back before it got dark. We had our lights on our bikes, but the road was just too rough and there were too many forks we'd taken. At night, it would be easy to miss a turn and get completely lost, but we seemed to be frozen in place. This thing kept swaying, but then it turned and grabbed an aspen tree and literally wrenched it from the ground, throwing it across the path. The tree was probably a good 15 feet tall, not a small one. Now, our way was blocked. What are we going to do? I kind of moaned to Cody. I didn't want her to think I was a coward, 
but I sure felt like one. We have to make a run for it, she replied. A very good, accurate run with no mistakes. Look, that log that thing threw down is on the trail isn't really that big. Do you think you can jump it? I don't know, I answered. I was still pretty wet behind the ears when it came to doing anything very technical on my bike. I tried a few jumps and such, but never anything much. We have to do this, Brad. You have to make that jump. You won't get a second chance. Stay right behind me and do what I do. If you crash, I'll turn around and come back. I won't leave you here. We'll both get on my bike, so don't be afraid. I knew Cody was trying to pump me up, and I knew if I didn't make it the first time, there was no way she could save me if that thing wanted me for lunch. Look, Brad, when you get to the log, bend your knees and pull up on the handlebars. Then lean back a bit, but not too far. Make your arms kind of stiff, then flex them as you land. Remember that dirt bump we practiced on? Same deal, just a little stiffer. Okay, I answered. Let's do it. And remember to be confident. That's the key. I laughed a bit at the irony. Be confident while jumping a log right in front of some huge animal that probably wants to kill you. We started our bikes, and as we did so, I watched the creature. It didn't move, but stood right next to the trail. I knew it meant to stop us. Why, I didn't know. Maybe it was trying to scare us out of its territory. Or maybe it had intentions of harming us. I'll never know. Cody was gutsy, I'll admit that. Not only gutsy, she had the experience to ride about anything. I was neither gutsy nor experienced, I was scared. I just wanted to get this over with. The tension was killing me. I nodded that I was ready, and she took off with me close behind. It was a good couple of hundred feet to where the Bigfoot stood, and... By the time we got to it, we were both going pretty fast. We needed the speed to clear that log. Kelly went flying right up to it, pulled back, lifted her front wheel, and slammed into the log with her rear wheel, which put her right over it. I wasn't very far behind her, and it looked to me that she had also slammed into the Bigfoot, but I couldn't stop. I did exactly as she had said, and I was soon over the log. I landed and started fishtailing, with dirt and rocks flying everywhere. I almost lost it, but managed to recover. I had no idea where Cody was at this point, but I knew she wasn't ahead of me. Oh man, what to do? I went a hundred feet or so, then slowed down, trying to look over my shoulder without stopping or crashing. Just then, I heard Cody's bike making that stinging, whining noise that two-stroke bikes make when they're being revved up. And then she was right beside me yelling, go, go, and I just gunned it and took off right behind her again. We rode like bats out of hell and didn't stop until we were far, far down the mountain, clear down by the gas wells and back on the maintained road. Cody pulled over and I pulled up next to her. She took her helmet off and just sat there on her bike. I could see her hands were shaking. What happened back there, I asked. I hit the damn thing. She pointed to her front fender, which was twisted around to where it almost brushed her tire. I whistled. Man, you're lucky you weren't hurt. Do you think you injured it? I think I might have, but it was so huge. It felt like I hit a wall. It knocked me and my bike down, and I just jumped as fast as I could and got back and took off. I didn't even look back. I have no idea if it was injured. Cody was rubbing her left arm. I asked if she was okay. She just nodded and took off. We made it back to the bike shop, as that's where Cody had parked her car. She always left her bike at the shop, as her parents lived about 10 miles away. I offered to drive her home, but she said she would be all right. That night, I got a call from her. It was pretty late, and she said she couldn't sleep that she needed to talk to me, and we just talked on the phone for a long time. Cody had been the one with an up-close and personal encounter. I'd only seen things from a distance as it was down on the ground with her and her dirt bike on top of it when I came blasting through right behind her. 
She wanted to talk about what she'd seen, which we did. We talked half the night before she was able to settle down and go to sleep. The next day, Cody came by the house and picked me up, and we went to a fast food restaurant and talked some more. She didn't want to be outside at all. I noticed she had two black eyes and her arm was all swollen. My dirt bike just sat in the garage after that, and I don't think Cody rode anymore either. My parents were puzzled, but I told them I was too busy to ride. By the time school came, I sold it. I'd lost all interest in riding. In fact, I'd lost all interest in any kind of outdoor sport. All I wanted to do was hang out inside and reach or watch TV. Cody sold her bike too and went off to State College in Fort Collins, and I lost touch with her. I went ahead with the mechanic course and ended up doing pretty well, eventually opening my own shop. To this day, I've never been back up in the books, though I do enjoy going out to the lake at the state park near town and fishing when I can. Like I said earlier, it's funny how you end up having an adventure you never dreamed of, and that's one I never want to have again. On to the next one. I'm from Malaysia. Me and my ex-boyfriend, my sister with her late husband, plus her two daughters. One only a few months old, the other one around nine years of age. We went for a swim by the popular beach destination, Port Dixon. We reached there around 6 p.m. It's quite late as we just decided we should go to the beach and just stroll around. Then my ex recommended we should go for a quick swim. As my sister and her husband, plus her small daughter, sat by the sea under the tree, three of us just having a good time swimming. But a few minutes in the water, I can feel something swimming around my leg. It went on and it doesn't seem to want to stop. I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me. I was watching too many horror movies. My ex is swimming in deep water. I'm in the middle and my niece is closest to the beach. I've got an uneasy feeling that I just can't shake. Then I called my ex-boyfriend and told him we should stop swimming. I swim back to the shallow water very fast. All of a sudden, my niece is screaming at me telling me what's behind you. At the same time, my ex is asking the same question. I don't want to look back. I just turned slightly my head and I saw a huge hand behind me. It looks like frog feet, but in a pinkish salmon color. I'm so terrified, screaming to my ex and asking what is that thing. My niece and my ex scream, told me to run and swim. Then I realized both of them are already by the beach while I'm still in the water, about my shoulder level. When both of them screamed, the thing jumped back into the water. I can see the tail exactly. It's like a fish tail, but huge, shiny pinkish gold, something like that. It is so huge, the water splashed so high. I swam and ran as fast as I could. Then, the three of us sat by the beach, dumbfounded, staring at the water, swirling in circles. I asked my sister if she saw or noticed the thing. She replied, it's like a human rose from the sea with huge, slanted, oval red eyes. Then, she scolded me for asking too much and said she doesn't ever want to talk about it. Many years after the incident, I switched on the television it was National Geographic Mermaid, Evidence Found. I watched it with goosebumps all over my body, a bit shaken because I realized, I swear, I've solved my own mystery. That thing I saw back then looks exactly like the one in the National Geographic program. It's true, and I do believe mermaids do exist. On to the next one. In the summer of 1977, I was 11 years old, and my great aunt owned a small four-room cabin in a remote part of Canada. 
the nearest town or neighbor was almost 10 miles away. Back in that day, we still used the old-fashioned ice box with a block of ice, a hand pump that brought water up from the lake where the cabin was built. We also had no electricity and, of course, no toilet, but we had an outhouse. It was early morning, and I was the first one up and had to go to the bathroom. So I went outside and walked to the outhouse. After I'd finished, I started to look around. Since we had arrived at the cabin when it was dark the night before, I wanted to explore, but I didn't get very far. I'd rounded the outhouse and was thinking about entering the woods. It was only a couple of minutes before I noticed movement about 30 yards from me. I froze and watched a huge, hairy creature walking on two legs, moving through the trees away from me. It wasn't making any sounds that I could hear. I just watched it until it became obscured by the growth of trees and shrubbery. Then I hightailed it back to the cabin. I woke my brother up to tell him, but he didn't believe me. Neither did my aunt. But she told me she'd heard strange howls and screams in the years before, blaming them on bobcats. My grandmother, who'd gone up there a couple of times as well, also said she'd heard the screams, said it terrified her, and she'd never went back. I spent the rest of our vacation playing only at the lake, looking over my shoulder and avoiding the woods altogether. Since then, I've been obsessed with cryptid and learning whatever I can, trying to weed through the fakes and hoaxes, trying to get another look at the being from my childhood. On to the next one. Years ago now, when we were able, myself and three other highly experienced mountain climbers were on a 12-day track up through the Himalayas in Nepal. We had passed Lamjung Kalis, not far from Annapurna 2, heading to Annapurna 3. The weather was atrocious. We'd managed to dig a small shelter out of the snow on a steep face to weather the storm. None of us could sleep all night, so when the howling scream wailed out that sounded close enough to see what made it, we all sprung up, looking at each other in horror. Even through the loud wind, we could hear thudding steps that seemed to walk straight past the entrance to the ice shelter we'd made. None of us could manage even a whisper, but the looks on each of our faces spoke a thousand words of terror. No way were we going out to investigate. Over the next five hours of night, which felt like five days, a few deep groans were heard in the distance. When we cautiously ventured out at light, the faces of terror I saw the night before were for good reason. There was one footprint at the opening to our shelter. In far enough as to keep sheltered from the wind and snow was twice the size of my foot in length and width and a boulder, maybe four meters from the entrance that would have to weigh over a ton with all four of us strenuously denying it was there the night before. Was this thing trying to seal our icy grave? We headed back to the base that morning, and three of us never returned to the mountain range again. On to the next one. This is a sighting I had at 15. I was coming home from a friend's house at about 11.45 at night. I lived in a small town, so I knew everyone in a 12-block radius to us, and having a big family, no one messed with me. On this night, I walked home past a nursing home. I always heard the night sounds, bats, dogs, cats, raccoons, but this night, I heard wings, big wings. Thinking a bat was coming at my head, I ducked and turned around. I saw a thing with big black bat wings landing in the tree about a block away. As the streetlight was by it, it was very clear. Two bat wings, 
a human body with arms and legs and a head and big oval red eyes. It turned and looked at me. I turned and started walking the half a block home a little faster. As I got by the door, I heard the wings and ran inside. Then I heard the footsteps on the roof lasting about five minutes. Years later, the Mothman was reported. Was it that? I have no idea. On to the next one. Travis Walton's friends knew him to be pretty daring. And when he and his logging crew encountered a UFO in an isolated clearing in the woods, Walton was the one who jumped out of the truck and boldly ran up to meet the occupants. He would come to regret this fateful decision, however, and quickly. Like something out of a science fiction movie, he was zapped with a blinding blast of light as a consequence of his bravery. Upon seeing this apparent act of alien aggression, Travis Walton's panicked co-workers were so consumed with fear that the driver hit the gas and took off in the other direction without even considering their zapped friend's welfare. But halfway down the mountain, as some of their initial terror began to subside, they realized they couldn't just leave Walton behind, so they returned to the scene. But neither the UFO nor Walton was anywhere to be seen. Unsure of what else to do, the group then filed a missing persons report. The authorities were skeptical of their story, to say the least. The investigators assumed that they were dealing with a homicide and believed Walton's friends and co-workers to be the prime suspect. Teams of detectives with cadaver dogs searched in a several mile radius of the last place Walton was seen, but there was not a trace of him to be found. But even without a dead body, they believed they just might have enough evidence for a conviction. Fortunately for Walton's co-workers, he resurfaced a week later with a tale that was truly out of this world. He said that as soon as the light struck his body, he felt like he had been hit by a Mack truck. When he regained consciousness, he was consumed by pain, pure, unadulterated physical pain. The blast of light he was struck with was more than illuminated particles. It had a very real physical quality to it. He wasn't sure if he had any broken bones, but his entire body ached. After taking in this throbbing pain, the next immediate sensation he experienced was the blinding light that was streaming from somewhere directly into his eyes. Where was this light coming from? As his eyes managed to crack open, he saw that there was a glaring rectangular light directly above him, fixed to the ceiling. He also became aware of some sort of device that was sitting snugly on top of his chest. It was a strange object that seemed to be doing some sort of diagnostic work or examination of his aching torso. His vision was still blurry in the glaring light, but he thought he saw movement out of the corner of his eye. Vague figures were busily doing something nearby. As he perceived someone wearing what he initially thought was a doctor's cap and mask, the thought came to him that he must be in the hospital. It was then that his memories of what had happened, of the strange craft and being struck with the light, came rushing back. He figured that after he was struck down, his work crew must have picked him up, thrown him in the truck, and took him to a hospital. As this explanation filtered through his consciousness, he focused on the doctor who was closest to him. It was as he stared out at this supposed physician that his vision finally cleared. And to his complete and abject horror, he realized that the entities that stood before him brandishing medical equipment were not doctors, at least not of the human kind. Whatever they were, Travis knew that he didn't want them touching him. He didn't want them anywhere near him. In his terror, he reflectively struck out at them and with one blow of his forearm managed to knock two of the entities who were standing over his right side backward as he simultaneously jumped off the table and ran into the corner. Travis instinctively knew 
that this would be the best way to keep the alien beings from ganging up on him. Travis Walton was a tough, no-nonsense lumberjack, and he knew how to fight. He was terrified, but he channeled that fear into pure flight or fight adrenaline. Literally backed into a corner, he was fully prepared to tear these creatures apart with his bare hands if he had to. But as it turned out, he didn't need bare hands to do the job because on a nearby table, he managed to snatch up some sort of instrument. It was a long glass tube that he figured would work just fine as a weapon. He could smash across the alien's oversized craniums. As anyone who has followed UFO lore will realize, Travis Walton's account of what happened to him on an alien spacecraft is a significant departure from the usual alien abduction narrative. In most reported incidents of these encounters, the ETs are portrayed as totally in control of the situation, while the poor abductee is rendered so helpless they can't even move a muscle. But according to Walton's version of events, these particular aliens were woefully unprepared to deal with an out-of-control human. According to Walton, after the beings saw him ferociously waving the elongated glass tube over his head, they suddenly turned around almost of one accord and took off out of the room and down the hall. Travis saw the beings made a right, so when he stepped out of the chamber, he purposefully cut a left determined to put some distance between him and his alien captors. The hallway he was traversing curved around the corner until he reached a room a short distance away. As he entered this room, he perceived that the far wall was transparent and he could see directly outside of the craft. By all indications, they were currently traveling through outer space. He saw the stars as they would appear on Earth except much brighter, freed from the light pollution of the planet. They glared out at him intensely through the wall in a stunning display that he never imagined he would see. Apparently, they were flying in near-Earth orbit. If it wasn't for the all-consuming terror he was filled with at the thought of being aboard this alien vessel, Walton might have actually enjoyed it. But this was not a sightseeing tour and Travis was absolutely frantic and searching for a way off that craft. The first, the fact that he figured he could find a way to escape a ship that was obviously no longer even on the planet shows how determined of a guy he was. Many others would have curled up in the fetal position and given up all hope at this point, but not the persevering Travis Walton. As he tells it, he was still searching for a way to get off or perhaps even commandeer the ship. Astonishingly enough, if we accept what he says is true, he may have almost succeeded in this task because right in the center of the room was what appeared to be some sort of chair at a control panel. Walton had apparently seen enough science fiction movies to know that this chair must have something to do with the navigation of the craft. So he sat right down into it and began fiddling around with the controls. He just might have been onto something because the intrusion was enough to send a decidedly human-looking entity ambling his way. As soon as Travis saw this figure approach, he got out of the chair and stopped what he was doing, not out of fear, but out of relief. You see, this creature looked just like a regular human being, and Travis was suddenly relieved with the thought that he'd actually found a friendly face to help him off this alien vessel. The face was human, and it was in fact friendly. The human-looking UFO occupant politely smiled at Walton and gestured for him to follow his lead. But as Travis let the entity escort him out of the room, he realized that whoever this person was, he certainly didn't seem to speak English. Travis peppered him with question after question, asking such things as, where are we? Who are you? Are you from Earth? But instead of vocalizing any sort of reply, the entity just continued to smile and nod. Travis says that the being was wearing some sort of helmet, like a NASA astronaut might wear. So at first, 
he thought that he just couldn't hear him through the glass visor. Given the human-like entity the benefit of the doubt, he let the man literally lead him by the hand to wherever he wanted to take him. Travis was ultimately let out into an upper hangar area of the craft where he observed several smaller saucers like the one he and his crew initially seen in the woods. They were silently parked like shiny sport cars. It was then that Travis realized that the craft that had picked him up must be one of the ones parked in this alien lot. And he was no doubt inside a massive alien mothership, spacecraft carrier to which the smaller scout craft had brought him. Perhaps Travis was hoping that his newfound friend was going to put him in one of these scout crafts and take him back to Earth. But instead of taking one of these saucers for a spin, the man led him into a small room at the end of the hangar in which he saw two more human-looking beings, another man just like the first and a woman. Both of them greeted him silently. The first man beckoned him to sit in a chair directly in front of the other two, then made his exit from the room. Travis said that these other two human beings did not have the NASA-style headgear on. Figuring that they must be able to hear him, he once again let loose with his barrage of questioning, hoping to get some sort of response. Instead, each one of them took one of his arms, led him to a table, and forced him to get on top of it. Travis began to struggle, but they overpowered him, and the female entity put a transparent mask over his face. There was a black ball on top of the mask, and the woman quickly squeezed it. It dispersed some sort of gaseous fumes right into Walton's lungs. He almost instantly went unconscious. The next thing Walton remembers is waking up, lying in the middle of the road, seeing the same flying saucer craft hovering nearby and brightly lighting up the street. Travis saw it for just a few seconds before it shot straight up into the air at an incredible speed, disappearing into the night sky and leaving him standing in the darkness, dazed and confused. Travis Walton, bewildered and frightened, looked around the area. He had been dropped off and began to recognize his surroundings. He saw illumination further down the path and realized it must be the town of Herbert Overgaard. As soon as he realized where he was, Walton made a beeline toward the light of Earthling civilization and eventually found a phone booth by a gas station. Working on sheer adrenaline, he threw himself into that phone booth and called up his brother-in-law in nearly incomprehensible hysteria. His brother-in-law, who had assumed the worst after Walton had been missing for five days, at first angrily assumed that he was being subjected to some sort of prank call. He nearly hung up the phone before Travis desperately pleaded that it was indeed him and he needed help. Realizing that he really was talking to Travis, his brother-in-law assured him that he would head right over. Upon reaching him, the first thing he said to the disheveled form of Walton when he found him slumped over in that phone booth was, Boy, am I glad to see you. The other members of his locking crew, who were sitting in police custody under suspicion of his murder, were quite happy to hear of his return. The police, not believing the lumberjack story of the UFO zapping Walton, had been working hard to pressure the confession to foul play in Walton's disappearance. They had even subjected the men to a battery of lie detector tests of the six men all of them passed, except for one subject whose results were inconclusive. But this man was deemed by the tester to be suffering from such extreme agitation and anxiety that it was directly interfering with the results of his test. At any rate, five out of six wasn't bad at all. The lie detector test results, by and large, indicated that the men were telling the truth, and they had in fact experienced something highly unusual. Just as they claimed, these results, coupled with the miraculous return of Travis Walton after a massive but unfruitful five-day search, were enough for the baffled authorities to clear the crew entirely. If what Walton claims happened to him really occurred is an extraordinary event on many levels. But beyond the obvious paranormal element, 
One other aspect of this case that remains rather thought-provoking is the fact that six innocent men were nearly wrongfully convicted of Walton's murder simply because Travis had vanished without a trace and no one could believe their testimony as to what had actually happened to him. If these events are true, it makes you wonder just how many people have been tried and convicted in missing persons cases in which the real culprit was something altogether alien to our understanding and experience. The sheriff's office involved in Walton's case still refuses to believe Walton and the logging crew's version, but without any other evidence, they have no choice but to file this case as completely unknown. On to the next one. My brother is a long-haul trucker out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and he had invited me to ride along on his next run since I was off work in the summer of 2010. It promised to be an interesting trip because we were hauling a trailer load of displays and equipment for the Sturgis, South Dakota Motorcycle Rally. I was excited because I am a history teacher in St. Paul, and I have been planning on teaching a special course on American history with an emphasis on the settling of the West. I had been to the Black Hills before, and I had been to Mount Rushmore and the Crazy Horse Monument, but I had never been to Sturgis. Our trip was quick and easy, but it became complicated when we pulled into the warehouse on Sturgis to unload our trailer. It seems as though there was another truck that was coming from Denver that had to be delayed, and that equipment had to be set up first before our load could be installed directly from our trailer. Clarence, my brother, was informed that the receiver would pay us to sit for a couple of days, and so we parked the rig and checked into a motel. This was great by me, and I talked Clarence into doing some sightseeing. He wanted to hit Deadwood for a day of gambling, and I agreed to that. But first, I had one major interest, and that was to visit the Sacred Bear Butte. This was a site that I knew of only through history of the Native Americans. It is a spot sacred to many tribes in the area and known to Native Americans throughout the United States. We arrived at the out-of-the-way park entrance at about 10 o'clock and parked our rental car in the parking lot. And after a quick trip inside the visitor center, I talked Clarence into climbing the trail up the mountain. It was quite steep, but well manicured, and the more we climbed, the more the scenery improved. After an hour or so, it seemed like we could see a hundred miles in all directions. At a point the ranger had mentioned, we began to see a ceremonial area where there were many strips of colored prayer cloth tied to the branches of trees and shrubs on both sides of the trail. We both sensed a strange silence where even the wind seemed to cease. There were signs asking for people to speak quietly and only if necessary. So, after respect the solemnity and reverence of this most sacred place, we passed next to another small plateau where there were tributes placed everywhere in the form of carvings, painted stones, and many ceramic tokens like birds, bears, and even some jewelry items. Clarence climbed up a ways above the ledge over the trail I was standing on, and when he returned, he was carrying a coin-like token and said, look at this, my new lucky charm. I immediately said, no, it's bad luck to take something from a First Nation grave. Clarence answered with, it wasn't on a grave, so I'm safe. And since we're on a sacred mountain, it should bring me luck at the casinos tomorrow. No matter how I protested, he wouldn't change his mind and put it back. I even offered to buy him a lucky charm at the gift shop, but he was determined. And he said, listen, brother of mine, I know you are a very superstitious guy, but I am immune to superstition. So let it go. I just shook it off and it was soon forgotten. The next day, Clarence and I were ready to hit the casinos. When we got to Deadwood, I was expecting to see some Old West tourist attraction, 
which I had heard our parents talking about when we were growing up. Well, there were many old buildings, but most buildings in town seemed to have casino and flashing glittery signs to cater to gamblers. We had come here to gamble, so in we went. We agreed to split up since we had our own preferences as to what games of chance we enjoyed. Meeting up again after two hours, I had lost about $100, but Clarence showed up sporting a new gold neck chain, and on it was the medallion that had been our point of contention. See, he said, I was right. After the chain, I'm still ahead 300 bucks. Well, we had a few beers and then gambled for a couple more hours, then called Sturgis. The other truck had arrived, so we could unload in the morning, so we had dinner and went to bed early to rest up for a hard day ahead. We were awakened sometime in the night by a loud thump, and the door of our room crashed in and caught against the safety chain that I was glad I had attached. Bolting out of bed, I slipped the chain off and went and opened the door. Clarence had joined me, and we both jumped outside, expecting to see some drunk, but instead we spotted a mangy, ragged beast. It was like a huge, shaggy black wolf, and it was just rounding the corner of the motel. I hollered, hey, and as I did, the beast stood up on its hind legs and turned to face us and let out a shriek that was between a growl and a scream. Then its eyes glowed red and made a slashing gesture toward us with its long, knife-like claws. Next, it dropped down and seemed to simply vanish. Clarence was visibly shaking when he said, Did you see its eyes? It was looking right at me, and I could feel its hate. I had seen it the same as him, but he seemed to take it personal. A couple of other guests, having heard all the commotion, said they thought it was an oversized scrawny dog. The next morning, we unloaded as planned, picked up the load for our return trip, and hit the road. Clarence was unusually quiet the rest of the trip home, and I noticed he kept reaching up and fiddling with the medallion, but he hardly spoke a word, just turned up the radio as if to block any thought of conversation. Well, anyway, I thought that it was all behind us, and when we got back home, everything seemed normal. But three weeks later, I got a call from my brother's wife, Liz, saying he had taken sick and the doctors didn't have any idea what it was. He had no body strength and no appetite. She said he was living on chicken soup, tea, and 7-Up. Then she told me that he'd been having terrible nightmares about seeing wolves and being lost in fog. It was then that she asked me about his new necklace, and she said he had ripped it off when he was sitting on the backyard patio, and then he threw it over the back fence into the field beyond. She said he told her it was a prize and mumbled it was trying to kill him. She said he had refused to talk about it any further, just that he said, my brother was right, it's cursed. Figuring that Liz needed to know what it was really all about, I recounted our trip to Bear Butte and our disagreement over the medallion. She admitted that she had seen it when Clarence first got back and he told her he had won it. Clarence was rapidly losing weight, and one day I got a call from Liz, and she was in a panic. So I hurried over to their house, and when I arrived, she came out to meet me and handed me the necklace with the medallion, sobbing. She said, remember when I said Clarence threw this away? Well, yesterday, when I helped him to the patio, there it was, neatly centered on the table in a neat circle, like someone had searched through that tall grass and thistles to find it, she said. Please, throw it away from me. I think it's killing Clarence. I looked in on my brother, and he was asleep. So, I returned home and worried over how to dispose of the medallion, because now I really believed there was truth to the legend after all. It was still two weeks before the start of school, so I began researching the internet, and it's surprising just how much information there is. I read enough of the Lakota Souks legend and superstition that I became convinced that there was truth to my fears of a curse. Many Lakota Souks believe that a ferocious beast in the form of a shaggy black wolf that was the size of a man 
Cunning, and Savage is a terrible avenger of the Lakota people. Reading this really hit me hard because we had seen the exact beast at our motel that so many legends described. There were ancient stories of a bear dog clan that lived in the caves of the moon, in an area in a remote location in the Dakota. Two hours later, I knew the only way to save my brother's life and to remove the curse was to return the medallion to Bear Butte. Dawn the next day found me on the freeway headed to South Dakota. Stopping only for gas and food, I slept a couple of hours in rest stops, but otherwise I drove nonstop until I reached the sacred park. I must have looked like death warmed over by the time I climbed the trail to where I recognized the area of offerings and almost totally out of breath. I removed the medallion from the chain and placed it in the area where Clarence said he had found it. Then I made a separate offering. I laid the gold chain across a rock alongside and said a prayer aloud, asking the spirit to forgive my brother. I slowly staggered back to my car and began my journey home. It was a cool evening, and I stopped at a roadside rest area. I heard the mournful call of a coyote far off, and as I gazed out the moon, I swear I saw a large black shadow cross the hill in front of me. A sudden sense of well-being came over me, and when I returned home, I stopped first at my brother's house. He met me at the door with a hug and a smile of gratitude. He told me that he had miraculously felt better two days before, and Liz told him where I had gone. All was well. It made a believer out of me and my brother. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!